I'm Daryl Morrison. I'll be the pastor here at Valley Gate Church. And to our guests, we've already greeted you, but I want to say greetings once again. Uh, excited to be here with you. Uh, we have a lot of things that God is doing in our church. And uh, next week, we will uh, have our moment in which we take our monthly building offering. And so we put together a couple of little snippets that will help you understand not so much just about our building uh, campaign, but more importantly, the reason behind why we're doing what we do. And so I'd love for you to take a look at this video. last year or so or more, we've been emphasizing the mission at Valley Gate, which is to love God, live for him, and lead others to Christ. How do you feel this campaign will embody that? So I think it starts with, I kind of want to summarize that. And I think it comes down to this phrase that we've been talking about is, win the valley. And uh, for me, that means that if we are living our lives as believers and we love God, one of the commissions that we have is to go and make disciples. And the part for me that's important is go, uh, which means that it's our responsibility to go reach people, to share Christ, and to then invite them into hopefully community where they can love God and live for Him. I think um, us being able to reach people and give them a picture of what it really means to love God and then to live for Him uh, I think it'll draw people. And so I have the full expectation that we're going to win the Valley, that we're going to do our part in terms of reaching people and touching people and giving them an opportunity to then come into community. And so uh, I believe and I pray that that's truly what we'll do is exemplify that. If we really love God and we live for Him, He tells us to lead people. That's the Great Commission. And so I believe we are making room and making space for those who we're praying for and who will ultimately come to the kingdom but also come to our church. I'm excited about this process that we're about to go through. Uh, last week, uh, last month, you guys received our pledge cards, and uh, this month we'll begin to give you instructions on how you begin to make your pledge. But more importantly, uh, we said that this is not a building campaign, this is a believing campaign. And we get to watch God do something cool inside of us. And uh, on those pledge cards, you'll notice uh, we ask you, what are you praying for? And why is that? We believe that the best way to give is to give out of faith and to believe, right? And so we want to stand with you. What are you believing God for? As you begin to set those things out and we begin to pray and see God do them, then it inspires you and encourages you that not only can you believe God for yourself, but you can also believe God for others. And so we're just expecting that miracles upon miracles are going to take place during this time. Not just that we get to build brick and mortar, but miracles upon miracles are going to take place during this time. And so as you begin to prayerfully consider what is it that God has called me to give, I also want you to prayerfully consider what is it, God, that you want to do or sow in and through me. And so it's going to be an awesome time, and I am looking forward to it. So next week we'll have a report for you. Our team will come up and give you a report, and uh, we'll also have a moment in which we can begin to learn more about how we can pledge. All right, you ready for God's word? All right. So we are to our guests. We've been going through the book of Genesis. And so we are looking at Genesis chapter 11. Uh, last week, we uh, studied Genesis chapter 11, verses 1 through 8. And uh, we learned about the Tower of Babel. And this is where uh, God's people chose to settle in this place called Shinar, which is present day Iraq. And there uh, it says that they spoke the same language and they had the same speech. What we noticed from that is that they were very, very powerful, which I think is beautiful, that when there's unity and oneness, there's power. When people finally commit to being unified and to do things as one, there's not much that can stop you, as the Bible told us, as God told us last week. And so instead of the people taking hold of the great privilege that they had, which was given by God to be fruitful, to multiply and to fill the earth, as soon as they begin to experience that they had power, as soon as they begin to understand that they could do things, they chose to settle. God wanted them to move, but they chose to settle. Why did they settle? Because settling represented stability and security. God said, be fruitful, multiply, increase, and fill the earth, which meant move, go, activate. But when they experienced good things, they chose to settle. Everybody say settle. settle. So their desire for stability, and then they desired to build a tower, the Tower of Babel, 
And that tower was created so that they could get as close to the heavens as they possibly could. And in some way, getting closer to the heavens not, didn't mean I'm getting closer to God. For them, it meant I'm getting closer to be like God. That they had something inside of them that they were trying to build a name and fame and notoriety for themselves instead of giving glory and honor to God for everything he's built for them. So you see where the skew begins to take place, that although there's power, their desires were not to honor God. Their desires were for stability for themselves and to create a name for themselves. And oh, I wish this just took place in Shinar. But it takes place everywhere that we go. People will use the church to build their name. People will use any platform they possibly can to build their name, to build their brand. I did a series a long time ago because everybody wants to know what's your brand now. And you know what I told them? Jesus is my brand. Jesus is my brand. There's no other brand that's greater. Nike's not better than Jesus. Adidas is not better than Je Louis is not better than Jesus. Whatever brand that you think is a beautiful brand and a good brand, it's not bigger. Your brand is not bigger than Jesus. So Jesus is our brand. And they tried to build a name for themselves. And so here's what God said. Oh my goodness, you recognize how powerful you are. And you recognize that when you have unity and you have power, there's nothing that can withhold, be withheld from you. So here's what I need to do. I need to come in and cause confusion. Because confusion is the only thing that can stop unity. So he caused confusion and he scattered the people. Another just cool thing about this story, when God tells you to do something and you choose not to do it, don't worry, he gonna make you do it anyway. <laughs> they wanted to stay, they wanted to build a tower and then God had to cause confusion and the first thing happened after he scattered them is they stopped building the tower. Because God wanted them to move. Everybody say move. That's why I came up with the title of this song. And y'all got to forgive me. I'm a little secular sometimes. And uh, a lot of times when things come to me, they come through songs. And even though I can't sing, whatever reason, I think through music. And so when people want to settle and God wants you to move, I believe that he was trying to help them understand something from that beautiful song. Keep on moving. Have you heard that song? Keep on moving don't stop like the hands of time go ahead no 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 i thought I, it sounded good when i was at home i promise you did everybody say keep on moving god's intent and purpose for each and every one of you is that you would keep on moving you are not created to be stagnant. You are not created to sit and be sedentary. God has created you. If you are a follower of Jesus Christ, simply by the name follower means you got to keep moving. Everybody say keep moving. You are not created to sit and just to settle. You are not created to be a squatter and one who just wants to maintain. God created you to grow. God created you to build things and keep building things. God created you to add and to increase. He says, be fruitful, multiply and increase the earth. Fill the entire earth. And too many people, you know what they want to do? Settle. They want to settle. So we're going to look in the text and, and I'm going to do y'all a favor this week. It's too, many, it's too many names in here that's going to mess y'all up. So I'm not even going to ask you to read, okay? Next week, though, you better be ready, okay? All right. So then once I start reading this, you're going to realize, okay, yeah, I wouldn't have wanted to read those names either, okay? So let's go to Genesis chapter 11. We're going to read verses 10 through 15. We'll start there, and we'll see how far we can go. Now we're talking about the genealogy once again. When we looked in Genesis, we noticed that there are different parts to the book of Genesis. And the way that we know that a segment has started and it has ended is they will always come to this point. It says, now this is the genealogy of such and such. And so we begin to see that God is helping us understand that there's lineage and there's life that's taking place. And he is moving through the lives of individuals. But as he's moving through the lives of individuals, catch me on this. It's not just that he's moving through names. He's moving through his plan and his purpose and those names have significance to his plan and his purpose. Because you're going to see some of them names and be like, God, I thank you that your, my mama did not name me that. But can I tell you something? Your name is in the book of life too. This is the genealogy of you. It's written about you. And that each and every one of these stories and each and every one of these people are a part of God's plan. So don't get caught up in the names. Understand that God is moving. So this verse 10 is the genealogy of Shem. Shem was 100 years old and he begot Arpaxad two years after the flood and he begot Arpaxad 
And after he begot Arpachshad, Shem lived 500 years, and he begot sons and daughters. Arpachshad lived 35 years, and he begot Shelah. And after he begot Shelah, Arpachshad lived 403 years, and he begot sons and daughters. Shelah lived 30 years and begot Eber. Everybody say Eber. Very important. He begot Eber, and Eber begot, uh, and after he begot Eber, Shelah lived 400 years, 403 years, and he begot sons and daughters. All right, so how many of y'all see why I didn't ask you to read them names? Okay, good. Say thank you, Pastor. Okay, good, okay. This segment right here is something very clear, okay? And, you, and, and I just want you to hear this. We start talking about Shem. Shem is actually the second in the line of 10 generations, okay? Shem is the son of Noah. Noah was the 10th generation who ended, and the Bible called him the comforter. He came to comfort the land. Noah's the one who they literally passed through uh, the days of destruction through the ark. That God was so discouraged by the people's perpetual and continual sin that he told Noah, I need you to build an ark. I have to destroy this thing, and I'm going to start all over. Start over, okay? Noah is generation number one. Why? It's because I want you to see when we get to generation 10. Shem is generation two. Shem lived 500 years and he bore sons and daughters. So that helps us understand that what God had proposed earlier, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth, even if they didn't want to, they started to. Many children and generations were born through Shem and all of those during this time. But they're also talking about a lineage. They're talking about a people, a people group. Now, the one that we're going to focus on, though, is Eber. I told you to say Eber. Why is Eber important? Eber is an Eberite. And it's a word that, we're, that we now call Hebrew, which means that Eber, through his family line, came the Jewish line. Israelites, Jews, Hebrews, children of Israel, all of those are the same. Because our Messiah and our Savior comes through that line. Now, all we know is Eber. And if any of y'all name your son Eber, come see me before you do. Okay, that's all we know. But the significance of him is that God, in the midst of all of these people, has birthed an Eber in this family line. Why is that important? Because the people had chosen to settle in Shinar. And you settle a lot of times because of comfort. You settle a lot of times because of fear of maybe moving forward. I don't know why you, sh you settle, but a lot of people settle, and sometimes when we settle, we settle for less. So they settled. So then God birthed Eber. You know what Eber's name means? It means to cross over from one location to another. So while everybody was settling and comfortable with settling, while everybody was okay with being where they were at, God said, I got to birth something inside of these people that is going to cause them to cross over from their good to their great. You know another reason why people settle? Because they're okay with good. They're okay with good. A lot of people settle because they're comfortable with the world's goods. Not understanding that God has something greater for them. And I wonder how many of us see the potential and see the goodness and see the greatness and see the promises over there. But we'll never cross over to go get it. But remember, keep on moving, right? God has a plan. And even when you don't realize that you've set and you stayed in the same place too long, God, I pray for each and every one of you that he'll birth an Eber through your family line. That somebody's going to help you cross over. We can't stay here anymore. Somebody's going to be in your family and say, I know what's in us. Let's keep going. We can't stop right here. I know that it's good and I know that it's nice and I know that this is better than anything that I had, but I'm not selling for the world's good. I want God's greatest for my life. And so what did he do? He planted an Eber inside of them so that they could cross over into what God had for them. So lesson number one, God has planted within us a seed to cross over from good to great. Nobody settles in bad. A lot of people settle in good. No one rests in destruction. But a lot of people will settle 
and insignificance. And so he birthed inside of them an Eber, a people who would cross over. And we'll see as we continue to go through this Bible that the Jewish people would be marked at least that we know of biblically of two times where they had to cross over. Everybody say cross over. God has created you to cross over and not settle where you're at. Verse, uh, verse 16 through 19. Eber lived 34 years and he begot Peleg. And after he begot Peleg, Eber lived 430 years and he begot sons and daughters. Peleg lived 30 years and he begot Reuel. And after he begot Reuel, Peleg lived 209 years and he begot sons and daughters. There's a formula here that is very consistent that you will see. It's the same formula when you read the Bible as they're going through the genealogies. They start with the father. They talk about how long he lived before he had his first son. Then they talk about the total years that he lived. And then it says that he begot more sons and daughters. Then they mention that son that he birthed. And it talks about how long that son lived. And then it mentions their first son. And then it says how long that one lived. And then that they begot sons and daughters. You see that very, very consistently. And so when you see these names, sometimes you can get caught up with like, man, what's going on with these names? And this is why I say keep on moving because even though there are names in the Bible, each one of these names have something to do with God's purpose for the people. Even though you just named your child something, your child has a purpose for what God is doing. Even though somebody just named you, you've been named and God has a purpose for your life. See, because God is not just a God of destination, but he's also a God of your destiny. And so when he begins to align your destiny with the destination that he has for you, each and every person that is in your life has something to do with what God has in store for you or where God wants you to be. It's not about the name. It's about the destination. It's about the destiny that God has for you. Why? Because God is guiding and moving. God is sustaining his people. God is creating special moments and revelation and great opportunities even when we don't see it. What am I saying? Don't get caught up in the names. Make sure that you see what God is doing now why is this lesson two even when you cannot discern or describe it you got to know that God is still moving even when you can't see it there's a song and I'm on my singing kick and I ain't gonna sing it <laughs> even when I don't see it you're working we sing this even when I don't feel it you're working you never stop you never stop working if do we really believe that when you see your storms do you know he's working when you see your difficulties, do you trust that he's working? When you see your disappointments, do you still believe that he is working? And so these names help us understand that God is at work doing things with people and situations that it may not seem like as much to us, but our God is a God who continues to be at work. Genesis eleven twenty twenty six. 26. I'm going through this fairly fast so we can get out of here. So, verse 20. Raul lived 32 years and he begot Serug. And after he begot Serug, Reuel lived 200 years, 207 years, and he begot sons and daughters. Serug lived 30 years, and he begot Nahor. And after he begot Nahor, Serug lived 200 years, and he begot sons and daughters. Nahor lived 29 years, and he begot Terah. Everybody say Terah. Terah. This name is important. After he begot Terah, Nahor lived 190 years and he begot sons and daughters. Now Terah lived 70 years and he begot a name that each of us will most likely be familiar with. What's that name? Abram. Okay? I will, I, you have to understand this. Abram is the 10th generation I'm talking about. Okay? I'm going to tell you what his name means in a minute. But Abram is the 10th generation that I'm talking about. The first 10 generations was Enoch. The people sinned in the garden. They separated from God. Cain killed his brother. A few generations later, I forget the, the, the guy's name, he bragged about killing somebody to his wives and said, I don't care, I'll defend myself. They continued in disobedience until Enoch, the 10th generation, decided to do something different. Enoch, instead of just continuing in perpetual sin, decided to call upon the name of the Lord. And if you remember the story about Enoch, it says he did not die. He walked with God. Oh, it's amazing. So then we get to our boy Noah. 
the people had lived consistently just sinning and doing what they wanted to do. And God said, I've had enough of this. I cannot believe that they will not listen to me. They keep doing what they want to do. They want to live the way that they want to live. They want to act like they're mad at me, but they really just want to do what they want to do. They, I can't believe this. He says, so listen, Noah, I need you to build a boat. And I want you to build this boat because I got to wipe. I got to wipe out this disobedience. Noah builds the boat. The boat that he builds in faith is the thing that carries him through deliverance. So now you have 10 generations, and now we get to our man, Abram, and we'll talk about this in a moment, okay? So 70 is a very important number in the Jewish tradition. 70 represents being set apart, sanctified, or holy. So Terah lived 70 years, and then he had a son. Terah, what was being birthed in Terah, had something to do with the people of God being set apart, being sanctified, and being made holy. Why is that important? You know what, means, what it means to be set apart? Being different. Now, I, I, that may not mean much until you realize how, and, and Daryl Morrison is on, I'm just fighting with culture. I'm in a cultural battle. Okay? Because you have to be set apart. If you are a believer, you must be set apart. I didn't say better. I always say that. Didn't say better. But you got to be different. You have to. I didn't say that be holier than thou. You got to be different. I didn't say look down on somebody who's doing the same sin you're doing. But you got to change your sin. You have to be set apart. Everybody say set apart. So because the people had just looked like the world and the culture that they were living in, God said that in 70 years, I'm going to birth through Terah something that is going to produce a people who are set apart. That's why I love the culture that we live in because we begin to take on the words and the nomenclature and everything that the, wor the verbiage and everything else that the culture says. You know, I'm 53 years old, so a long, long time ago. Long, long time ago. You know what they called marriage? It's a relationship between a man and a woman. I'm 53, because I know I'm old. But I can verify that because it's also in my Bible. Okay? Culture. Everybody say culture. Culture will change the way you speak. And when culture changes the way you speak, it'll change the way you think. And when culture changes the way you think, it'll shape the way your children live. You think, I'm, you think okay, I ain't lying. So then we started with marriage and 53 years old, long, long time ago. Remember I said that they talked about this in like Genesis chapter one and two, a, a husband and a wife, they talked about that. But then all of a sudden culture started, it flipped me out all of a sudden they started talking about, oh, this is my partner. Partner? When do we become partners? This is my partner. So now, we, everybody say we. We say what they say. <laughs> this is my partner. See, husband and wife, from what we see, it says that a man shall leave his father and mother and be cleaved to, and cling to his wife. It says that you must die for your wife. You must give your life for your wife. You must offer her, offer her to yourself as radiant without a wrinkle, a spot, and a blemish. The word says that a wife must submit to the husband as to the wife. And I know y'all don't like that submit word, but it's in the Bible. Take it up with God. Okay, and so it's in there. But it, then it says this, if you're going to submit, you don't submit to a man first. You should have already submitted to God first. That's what the Bible says. Partner means 50-50. <laughs> you do yours, I'll do mine. We're Dutch. You got yours, I got mine. Dutch. I don't even know what it is now. I don't even know what you're calling now. And so we start listening to the ways and the words of the culture and they begin to change our culture. You ain't never gonna hear me say, this is my partner, it's my wife. I'm just being real with you. I'm holding true to at least some of it. This is my partner. But the Bible says a husband and a wife. And don't get me over here to where now I don't know which one is the husband and which one is the wife. 
Don't let, uh, everybody say culture. culture. God didn't teach you that. The culture did. And so God had to now birth something to begin to cause his people to be sanctified and set apart from what the world was doing. And he birthed it through Terah. Abram, his name, is very important because now he's the 10th generation. The number 10 in the Jewish culture means new beginning. So you see, when we go back, everyone, so we see Enoch, it had to be a new beginning because these folks were killing people and bragging on each other. So Enoch had to say, we got to call on the name of the Lord. Then we see that these people were just living in perpetual sin and doing whatever they wanted to. So then Noah had to come because it had to be a new beginning because God says, I got to clear this thing out. And so now the people are continuing back. And that's what I've learned. Here's what I've learned every time I keep reading these stories. It's a whole, 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 whole bunch of people who like to sin. And it's only a few people who want to do what's right. It's a whole, whole bunch of people who want to do their own thing. And then about every 10 generations, God like, okay, let me fix this. So now he comes and he invites into this story a man named Abram. Hebrew, they call him Avram. Av means father. Ram means exalted. So whatever God has in store now, it is going to come through an exalted father. That's why as we begin to go through this, I want to encourage every man, whether you're a husband or a father, to come to church because we're going to see what a man's man looks like. We're going to see what a biblical man looks like. I want you to bring your families and even if they don't want to come, come by yourself because we're going to see what it looks like to be a man who's been exalted to be a father because each and every one of you, God has created you and planted a seed inside of you to be exalted, not just to be the man to tell people what to do, not just to try to act like you got rules and everybody got, you got to learn how to be a father. And the only way that you can learn how to be a father is if you've been fathered by the father. I had to tell my mother, because I used to do it when I was young, Happy Father's Day. I tell my mother that because my father was absent. And God was like, she don't know how to father you. It's the truth. She does not know how to father you. She can be an amazing mother, but I didn't give her the capacity to father you. That's not disrespectful. That's honoring her. But remember culture, oh, it's Father's Day. I want to wish my mama a happy Father's Day. Nonsense. I know, I'm long gone past trying to impress people so that they will come to church. I'm at the point now where I want to see people grow in their relationship with God more than they want to be cool with me. I said, Mama, I love you too much, man. You've been an amazing mother. You sacrificed more than anything you could possibly do. But I still know some things inside of me that I need from a father. I, I do. Like, I, man, you've given me more than anything I... I I, you are a superwoman, but you suck as a dad. <laughs> Exalted father. God's purpose to sanctify his people, to set them apart, is marked by the people's willingness to be holy. If we really want to be set apart, you can't look like everybody else. You can't sound like everybody else. Can't talk like everybody else. Can't do whatever everybody else does. I don't know about you, uh, but do any of y'all, uh, God has showed you that you've been set apart because every time you try to sin like somebody else, you always get caught. That's me. I learned that a long time ago. I start trying to do what everybody else do, start sitting up there, oh, I'm gonna, and man, I, I'm, I'm the one who get caught. We in college, everybody's stealing books and giving them to their little girlfriend because we're on scholarship. Only two dudes got caught, me and Mike Skurlock. Both the little dudes are trying to act like we're Christians. They put us in a little class, a stealing class. And uh, I'm sitting there, I'm like, man, I feel like I'm in jail. All of the other dudes got away. I got a friend who goes to church right now. He's not here, but he laughed at me. You're the only one who got caught stealing them books. I can't get away with sins that other people get away with. I can't, I can't do the things that other people do, even when I try. You know why? I've learned it. Because God has set me apart. If you ever have gotten to that point, you're like, man, I keep trying and it never worked the way it worked for them. You set apart. It's just the truth. And God has created a people to be set apart. It's just the truth. And so he's created them to be set apart. 27 to 29. 
Terah begot Abram, and then they change it because he mentions all three of Terah's sons. Everyone else is just the only son. Terah begot Abram, Nahor, and Haran, okay? So you see there's another Nahor here. Don't get it mixed up with the one up there. This is Terah's son. There was another one who's like a great, great, great grandfather. And so Terah begot Abram, the oldest son, Nahor, the middle son, and Haran. Haran begot Lot, or what they would say is Lot. And Haran, the the, the, the third son, he died before his father in uh, Terah in their native land, Ur of the Chaldeans. He died, guess where his son died? In Iraq. Babylon. Mesopotamia. These are all the same names. Ur of the Chaldeans is Ur Kishdim. Kishdim means Chaldee in English. Chaldean, and all it is, he, you know what? God spread everybody, but guess what your boy Terah wanted to do? Stay right where he was at. And so his son died. His sons, were, his sons died where they were born. Well, his son died where he was born. And he died before his father. So this is the birthplace of Abram. It's the death place, the, 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 the place of death for Haran. And here we see that some other things take place. 29, then Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. And the name of Nahor's wife was Milcah. She was actually the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah, and the father of Ishka. This is now about alignment. This is, the, this is one of the, this is probably the second time that we've noticed in the Bible that a woman is being mentioned. And um, I know that may make, make some folks feel a certain way. But I want to encourage you. Culturally, they didn't mention women. But when they did, they mentioned them women because those women were bad. When you mentioned a woman up until this point, it was because she birthed someone of significance. When you mentioned a woman up until this point, it is because through her would come someone who would change the world. When you mentioned the woman, it talked about something that God is about to do and it's going to come through them. So women, what comes through you changes the world. Women, what God allows to be birthed through you changes generations. Women, you birth significance, and you must understand it. And so Sarai and Milcah, why is this important in terms of alignment? Because Sarah's name, Sar, the root word, means a minister to a government's cabinet. It means high official, a ruler, and an important individual. So here's what God is saying. I'm about to birth greatness through Sarah. I'm about to birth a high official through Sarah. Milka means queen. And when you add these two together, it means that I am about to birth royalty because I'm about to birth my kingdom. You got to hear me. God is birthing his kingdom through this lady. His kingdom. Not just a person, his kingdom. And he's going to birth it through this lady. The names speak to royalty, to the kingdom of God, and the pictures of these women birthing through them is birthing redemption for an entire kingdom. Lesson four, God's purpose has a lot to do with where you're going and not where you're at, who you're aligned with, and what's going to come out of you. When you think about God's purpose, it's God has something in terms of where he has you going. He has something associated with who you're aligned with. That's why I say you better check your friends. If your friends are going nowhere, guess where you're going? Nowhere as well. And then the next thing is, is something is going to come out of you. And so it's not where you're at, it's where you're going. So don't be a squatter. You have to ask yourself, who have I aligned with in my life? That's divine purpose. And then a kingdom can come when you recognize you've been called to birth it. That is destroying any doubt that anything good can come from you. A lot of us don't believe good can come from us. You must fight the doubt that good 
cannot come from you and believe for certain that God can birth something amazing through you. Verse 30 to 32. Now, this is the one that gets me. I just told you all these wonderful things. But Sarah was what? She was, she was what? She had no children, didn't she? So Sarah was barren. She had no child. And Terah took his son Abram and his grandson. And I don't want you to forget this because we talked about Sarah. But if you know, remember I said keep on moving? Guess who's on the move now? Terah. So now Terah took his son Abram and his grandson Lot, the son of Haran, and his daughter-in-law Sarai, and his son's, and his son's wife, and they went out from Ur of the Chaldeans to go to the land. Where are they supposed to go? Canaan. And they came to Haran, and what did your boy Terah do? Dwelt there. He settled. So the days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died where? In Haran. Let's talk about Sarah for a minute. We just said that something great was going to be birthed through her. We just said that the kingdom of God was going to be birthed through her. We just said that the anointed thing was going to come through her. And then we have to look at the fact that she's barren. And that's another challenge that we have when you believe it's in you, but you can't birth it. You know he gave it to you and he promised it to you, but you can't seem to bring it forth. Why is that important? Because you can never birth kingdom things. Only God can. So God w wants us to see this picture that I have greatness in store for you, but you have to depend upon me and trust in me. See, barrenness doesn't mean that you can't birth. It just means that you place your trust in something else. And when you place your trust in something else, it can't produce what God wants to produce. But when you start trusting in God, God will birth to you things that you never thought could come from you. So she's the picture of humility and she is the opposite of pride because pride is selfish. Pride is sinful. Pride can always be focused on I. Pride is the thing that doesn't please God. And a lot of times we know that the things that we receive, you can build it, you can accumulate it, you can have it, but you can know that you're barren because every time you get it, it doesn't matter how big it is and how good it is, you still feel empty, you still feel frustrated, you still feel cheated, and you never feel satisfied. Because it's not about what you get, it's the one who gives it to you that satisfies you. So we see that this is a picture of humility and dependency upon God. And then the other thing is this. He settled. He settled. They were moving and going to Canaan. But he settled in Haran. You can never arrive to the fullness of God's destiny for your life. Peep this. If you choose to stop early. Simple. Simple. You can never get there if you choose to stop early. Never. Um, how many of y'all ever taken road trips? Okay, good. How many of y'all on those road trips you stop at the pit stop? I think, what is it called? That's what I call it, a pit stop. What is that little thing? Rest area, rest area. Is that what it's called? Y'all know what I'm talking about. No, no, not even a gas station. It's the one where it's off to the side and all they got is a little porta potty and then they got the place where you can go get a couple of cookies on the side right there. Yeah, okay. You know what I'm saying? Little porta potty, and then you can, you can buy the little, you know, buy the little cookies and donuts, and, you know, right? Yeah. Rest stops. That's what they call rest stops. Rest areas. <laughs> Whatever you want to call it. I like, I like it better than porta potties and the little concession stand. But you see the way it's built. It's not built for you to live there. It's not built to sustain you. It's not built for you to remain. And Tara died at his rest stop because he was unwilling to go to the destination that God had for him. He got comfortable. Maybe it was okay. Remember I said keep on moving? You know, the only thing that caused Tara to leave was that his son died. 
Hear me on this. See, a lot of us, the only time we leave or the only time we move is when it's bad. And you know what that's called? Running. Running away. You'll never experience God's destiny for your life running from something. But when you know you're called to something, you will always experience greater. When you know he called you to this, he always has something in store for you. So he wanted them to keep moving. And, and, and Pops almost got him there. That's why I need the dudes to come. Almost got him there. And for whatever reason, he chose to stop. What stops us? What makes us settle? Instead of keep going. Just keep on moving, right? He died in Haran when God's destiny for his life was gone. He didn't die there because his time had expired. He died there because he didn't want to extend his time. He didn't want to go further. And man, as a people, I just hear God singing that song. Keep on moving like the hand of time. Like we have to move. I love this. I like reading this Bible. Like I couldn't make this stuff up was moving a people to their destined purpose, to the plan that he had in store for them, and they were resistant, they were obstinate, they wanted to stay where they were at, they liked where they were at, and they didn't want to go. And he had something greater for them. So in the course of this, when they wanted to stay, he had to birth an Eber inside of them, someone who would help them cross over. In the course of this, for them to really be what they needed to be, he needed to have somebody who's going to help them move into their new beginnings. So he birthed an exalted father because he couldn't let them settle, settle for less, and settle for what was not for them. I say it like this, two things. I've seen a lot of people, a lot of people die for less instead of living for greater. They settled. They died for less. And I want to be a dude dying. I want to die doing God's will. I want to die right in the middle of God's will. I've just, I've just, this is in my heart. If you're in Christianity for retirement, you need to get out. We carry this thing all the way to the end. We live out his purpose. Live it out. You don't take a break in Christianity. You don't, this is not about comfort. It's not about just us getting the things that we want. It's about becoming who God has created you to be and being what he's called you to be and reaching the destination that he had for you. Listen, if you don't go, your children can never get there. I'm just gonna let them figure it out you're leading them into being lost when you had the destination and so God is calling his people to keep on moving amen, amen. let's pray I'm passionate about this I'm just crazy enough to believe that God really does have a plan for his people and it includes each and every one of you you're not here because of what you do you can be gifted you can be talented you can be articulate you can be smart you're here because of who God has called you to be you're here because God has a purpose for your life 
you're not here because of duty you're here because of worship because God has a purpose for your life and if at any point it becomes duty more than devotion let me know so we can give you a break because everything we do is out of our devotion to him because God has a destiny for our life amen keep on moving let's pray father we thank you we honor you and we love you we believe you're an awesome God and amazing we talked about how great you are but I pray we'll never forget just how great of a plan and destiny you have for us so for people here God I pray that they would keep on moving it's in your name I pray everybody say amen God bless you love you